Say what? So our very efficient capitalist medical system is definitely going to take the opportunity to, like, manufacture treatments that can cure AIDS, right? Please, please, please give me some hope in this world. ...using Nobel Prize winning CRISPR gene editing technology. The hope is to... Oh wow, so they're using gene editing for something other than eugenics? Cool. ...ultimately be able to rid the body entirely of the virus, although much more work is needed to check it would be safe and effective. But See, this is the difference between socialism and capitalism. This is why we need socialism so fucking bad, because with central planning worldwide, under worldwide communism, like... We would have lauded these scientists. We would have fully funded and supported them, gave them everything they need. And by this time next year, or by this time in five years, we would have had a cure for fucking HIV. HIV would have gone the way of fucking polio. Actually, did you know kids in Africa are still getting polio? Yeah. You've got fucking medieval diseases still fucking people up. Let's get more on this and speak with Dr. Jonathan Stoy, a virus expert at the Francis Crick Institute. Hello. What? Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, did you actually think that I was going to apologize for something? No, I have done absolutely nothing wrong. I have done absolutely nothing to be sorry for. Hey, welcome to you. Thanks for being with us. So just explain how this process works. Well, I think before I do that, I have to give you a little bit of background about HIV and the disease it causes. So when HIV uh, infects a cell, it kills it usually. And this can result in AIDS and people will die. However, we have worked out ways to treat the virus and stop it growing. And if you take your HIV medication... Why are we not funding this? You don't. And, like, funny thing is, like... Like... if You might think it's a whack job conspiracy theory, but, like, I believe we already have the cure for AIDS. Like, I strongly believe we already have the cure for AIDS. But then I let anybody but rich people get it. Like, if Bill Gates got AIDS tomorrow... They would have his ass cured by next week. Like, I strongly believe that. But, like, poor motherfuckers like you and me? No, we ain't getting it. <laughs> no. Like, why? Why? Who gives a fuck about us? That's why we need socialism. Succumb to AIDS. However, this is, there is a problem here. Because we can't get rid of all the... Yeah, Ruddy Dury says that Cuba already has a lung, lung cancer vaccine. Yeah. The country that is probably single-handedly responsible for giving the most people lung cancer because of those dank cigars is now curing it. Actually, no, the United States is responsible for giving people lung cancer because the United States manufactures all the cigarettes. Thank you, Philip Morris. Virus. Some of it will infect cells, go to sleep, and persist for a long, long time, but occasionally reactivate. And if we are not taking medication, we're back. Like, this is the disease that, like, like people in the 80s, of course, thought it was, like, a gay disease. Of course, I'm black and gay. And now it's widely seen as being a black people's disease. Like, there are countries in Africa that have astronomical HIV AIDS rates. For one, because of, like, there's no public health system to speak of. There's no sex education or anything. And then, like, for two, like, there's no treatment available. So you have countries that have life expectancies of, like, 40, 45 years old. Like, 45 is still fucking young. We might consider people like that boomers. But no, 45 is relatively fucking young. Like, the older millennials are, are 40, 45 years old. So you have people in Africa that are dying from AIDS at the age of 45, and nobody gives a fuck because, like, who gives a fuck about Africans? The West doesn't give a fuck about Africans. It sees Africa as nothing but a source of raw materials and labor and a place to dump surplus products and old clothes. Like, the average Westerner's image of Africa is some fucking kid with flies eating out his eyeballs. And that is atrocious. Like, Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth. That's why every imperialist power has wanted a piece of it since the fucking 1800s. Yeah, like, once they found out all that shit that's in the interior of Africa, they basically carved it up like a fucking cake at the Berlin Conference. <laughs> Like, Africa still is not fully decolonized. Most of the countries that achieved their independence in the 60s and 70s, now they've succumbed to neocolonialism and neoliberalism, just as Kwame Nkrumah uh, pointed out. Because, like, and Fanon said, like, just because you raise a fucking flag and you have a national anthem, that doesn't mean you're free. 
you're still colonized mentally and uh, in most cases physically. Like, have you considered, like, why the fuck does France own all of Niger's gold? Why the CFA Frank is a thing? Why there are military bases? Like, why the fuck does America have military bases in Africa? Why does AFRICOM a thing? Why are you using your military to meddle in other people's affairs? That's why, like, U.S. imperialism has to be stopped. That's what they're waiting for. That's why they keep saying down with U.S. imperialism. I'm not saying down with Americans. They don't want to kill us just because we're Americans. They want to get rid of us because, because we fucked their countries up. Like, that's literally why. They have nothing, nothing against the American people. Like, you see the Palestinian people. You see the Yemeni people. They, they laud Aaron Bushnell. They view Eric Bush as a fucking martyr, as a fucking hero. They don't hate Americans. They hate what America does. That's why we have to stop what America does. America is responsible for AIDS and HIV. Am I saying that they cooked it up in a fucking lab? Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. But the rampant denial of the fruit of Africa's labor has basically forestalled and stopped the growth of progressive governments that can lead to the development of a workable public health regime for the continent. So of course you're going to have these people that, that like these people are not in tune with fucking modern medical science. They don't know anything about like how this stuff spreads. Like an, a, an average fucking Zambian peasant or an average fucking peasant in, uh, in Eswatini in Swaziland. They don't know. Lesotho, they don't know because these people are not being taught. Their own government is full of crooks. They're not going to fund sexual education in the schools. They're too busy filling their own pockets and building another fucking mansion for the polygamous king. That's why we have to end imperialism. To square one again. So for a number of years, scientists have been trying to find ways to get rid of the HIV from our cells. And this CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which we've heard about, is the current... Reagan did make fun of queer men dying of age when he was president of the United States. And it wasn't just queer men. It wasn't just queer men. It was uh, also heroin users and Haitians and homeless people. I believe they called it the four H's. Because again, like people didn't know shit about how AIDS transmits. They thought it was just for gay. So I'm straight. So I can go and sleep with this fucking hooker. I'll be cool. As a matter of fact, that's what actually got the, uh, the American regime up off its ass when they found out that uh, heterosexual people could get it too. Yeah, they literally talked about it in a documentary. I can't recall the name of it. But uh, Rising Up Angry, I believe, is another good documentary. It chronicles the development of uh, ACT UP, which was a major organization that was um, that was ran mainly by queer people. And it basically forced the FDA to, um, to release life-saving drugs. And yeah, it's really dope. Act Up is actually one of my favorite organizations. I believe they're still around. I have a book on them. It's called Let the Record Show. But yeah, it basically shows how the uh, Reagan administration was abysmal on AIDS. Like, you thought Trump's COVID response was bad? Like, no. Reagan was basically going to let HIV just wipe out an entire generation of, uh, an entire generation of struggling people. Best chance of doing this. It consists of a way of, of delivering an enzyme into a cell that will cut specifically the virus, and it has this enzyme plus guides that will target it to give it this specificity. The experiments we've heard about are in cells. Um, they're not in, in, in humans or, or primates, but there is every hope that this kind of technology will be useful in the future in order to try and get rid of uh, of HIV from this latent reservoir. So how far off do you think scientists are in uh, being able to get this treatment to work effectively then? Well, there's a lot of, there are a lot of problems. You have to remember, we, we don't know very much about this viral reservoir. There are probably at least 10 to the nine cells, a billion cells that carry these proviruses. And we don't know how many of those we have to eliminate in order to cure people from AIDS. Logan, I love how, like, you make your comments and then you end each one with an exclamation point. It's like you're a little kid and you're finding out, like, these secrets of life for the first time and you're so fucking stoked and pumped about it. And these are horrible things we're talking about, but I love your energy. 
And so this work is ongoing. Now, some studies have been carried out in animals, um, and there have been... The CC, here he goes again, it's like a, it's like a fucking five-year-old. I hate every U.S. president. Ports of 70 or 80 or 90 percent elimination of the reservoir. I'm not making fun of you, though. It's very, it's, it's very endearing. But we don't know whether that's enough. And this is something that will be important. Jesus, am I developing parasocial relationships with people in my chat? I need to go outside. To discover in the future. It, it's a real problem. If only, suppose only 1% of this reservoir survives, will that reactivate and cause... His wife didn't leave him. He doesn't have a wife. He's joking. One of the arch villains of this show, even probably prior to my time, I mean, Sam would still reference him, but if you did a heat map, these references are getting less and less. As All right, Altuze, you need to chill out. Lieberman faded from, um, you know, acting on a... If you don't know who Altuze is, he's basically a... Uh, French, it's always the fucking French. Well, at least I think he was French with a name like Althusser. He really doesn't have the choice to be anything but French. But uh, Louis Althusser, he was like a Marxist philosopher. And the only reason that I know who he is is because he also, like, had some type of mental breakdown and he ended up strangling his wife to death. So whenever somebody brings up Althusser, like, I always have to bring that up. Like, I, I find it very difficult to take seriously the thought and writings of somebody that strangled his wife to death. I'm sorry political scene doing horrible things and yeah you know he's another guy who it is it would be a mistake to uh, or like medical in the senate for killing the this is an interview that Mehdi Hassan did in 2021 which is universally on the fuck did this end up in my interesting things playlist these people are boring as understood fuck. to be a horrific thing that the United States a big did. fat mistake as uh former president Trump uh, said in a Republican debate. Killed hundreds of thousands of people, destabilized the region, gave rise to groups like ISIS, um, all under false pretenses of Saddam Hussein developing um, a nuclear weapon or weapons of mass destructions, which were... Well, before I let you go... Yeah, there you go. That's what I came here for. Like, why does it always have to be two fucking boring-ass white people talking? Get to the fucking rare meat, man. Yo, I so yeah, Joe Lieberman died the other day. Honestly, I thought he died 10 years ago about Iraq. He, he, he looks like a fucking sad puppy. We just uh, saw the 20th anniversary of 9-11, the end of the Afghan war. You have Joe Lieberman on why centrism will save D.C. from gridlock. Someone like Chris How can we save D.C. from white people? That's my question. Chris Murphy now representing Connecticut, the USAP in for the Senate. How do I decide what goes in my playlist? Either people send me shit or like I just scroll through my fucking YouTube recommends and put shit on. Uh, this must have been added on absentmindedly. He's very critical of the Iraq war. Have you uh, disowned it? You know, as recently as 2015, 2016, you were still saying you thought it was a good thing overall. It was a disaster. Are you willing to say tonight it was a disaster? You were wrong. You regret it. You apologize. Well, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, I'm not. I mean, look, I was in the majority of members of the Senate Democratic Caucus who voted to authorize... So, Lieberman, yeah, he was Al Gore's running mate in 2000. Um, you know, the election that the Supreme Court basically handled, handed to Bush on the basis of like 50 votes. <laughs> but am I saying that Al Gore would have been a better president? Honestly, no. Like he may not have gotten us into a fucking idiotic war in the Middle East, but like, no. Al Gore is just as much a Leo neoliberal as Bush was. President Bush. What's up, Nate? Been back to Mexico lately? We go to war in Iraq to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Uh, after the war, after Saddam went into hiding until we caught him. Uh, the Have I seen any of One Dime's videos? I actually collaborated with them on his, uh, well, I would call it a collaboration, but I, um, I read a quote in his Cultural Revolution video. But yeah, I like Tony One Dime. He's a cool guy. Bush administration. Even though uh, he's a fan of Zizek, who I despise for obvious reasons. I think I covered, covered it last week. But, yeah, he's a cool dude. Just because somebody has uh, has problematic idols, as long as your fucking idol isn't Hitler, I, I'll get along with you. She made some big mistakes. And, and that uh, oh. went to the whole way in which they handled Okay, yeah, you know what? I, I can't listen to this guy. How do these boring-ass people end up being in the Senate for, like, 50 and 60 and 50 and 60 fucking years? Like, what? Retire. Retire. I'm glad you're dead, buddy. 
Sorry, Lieberman. The thing with Zizek is like, yes, I did dislike him before his racist ass comments. He's a charlatan. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Honestly, I wish he was, I wish he was where Joe Lieberman is now in hell. Like uh, it just, everybody that likes Zizek that I've met personally, like in real life, is the most insufferable fucking hipster. The most insufferable fucking hipster. He is like the literal, he is like the walking embodiment of why Mao said to read too many books, uh, to read too many books is harmful. Like you could eventually fall down enough rabbit holes and get too caught up in smelling your own intellectual farts that you end up saying fascist fucking shit and you end up arguing uh, fascist fucking shit under the guise of the left. That's why I hate academics so much, even though technically I am one because I did go to college, but I'm glad that I don't work in that fucking field. Because, like, it's just the fucking egotism and the intellectual masturbation. It's too much for me to stomach. It literally makes me physically ill. So Black Panther is one of my all-time favorite movies. It has major... Hey, it's Unk. ...thematic and political issues. I know, I know, Dr. Ball, sir, I'm sorry, don't judge me. You already know. But at the end... I am so jealous of his fucking hair. Like, I wish I had hair. At the end of the day... It hits so many weak points in my psyche that I can't help. But you know, you know, my brother has actually like organically found FD signifier. Like I didn't even recommend him or anything. I didn't recommend him to him, to him or anything. Like he just organically stumbled across one of his videos. So now my little brother is an FD signifier fan. I love it on so many levels. FD signifier is a lot more useful and intellectually honest than G-Shack is. Seeing it opening night dressed in the dashiki I wore to my late aunt's funeral in Atlanta, surrounded by other black folks in their best African attire, some of them actually from Africa, most of them just folks from around Atlanta, is one of the best. Honestly, like, I, I remember this. Like, I remember when this film first came out. And, like, this was a moment. Like, this was a very important cultural moment for, for black people. Like, here we are finally represented like we've actually got little black kids that could look up and see somebody that looks like them we could actually look up and see somebody that looks like them like when chadwick bozeman died like little kids were fucking tore up because like oh black panther died like it, it's this was a moment like it was a cute fucking moment for black people all around the world Best experiences I've ever had at a theater. It left such a mark that making a video on that movie was one of my longest standing goals when I became a video essayist. And I'm super proud of that video because in the world of angry white guys yelling reviews, they, along with some of my faves, missed a lot about this movie in their content that left me incredibly frustrated, which led me to making videos in the first place. That said, there's one glaring thing that I missed even, and I only noticed while I was going through the editing process to finish that video that I couldn't put in at the last minute. A big detail that illustrates the depth of the comic and the film's commentary on the black diet. Slow Panther says that one of my teachers told me that when he died, some kids were actually pulled from school because they was having breakdowns. Chadwick dying still shocked me. He kept his problems very well hidden, so it was just so sudden when he passed through it, man. Yeah. Yeah, like, black men are susceptible to a, to a lot of health problems. Um, because it's not that we don't take care of ourselves. It's that, that it's that the medical system in this country is fucking racist. It hates black people and black women, especially they go through fucking hell. And like, uh, number one killer of black men is uh breast cancer, not breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, other end of the body. I'm sorry, but, uh, but like, it's serious. Like Martin Luther King's son, uh, Dexter, I think just died from prostate cancer. Um, so yeah, if you're black. It's very important that you uh, that you research, that you do your own research, and if necessary, argue with your doctor. Like you know your body, you know your body, and otherwise, like these people, like there's so many cases. Like I was talking with my coworkers earlier, um, my coworker's grandson was uh, went to the one of the hospitals in St. Louis, Cardinal Glennon, and uh, like he was having breathing issues, and they were like, "Oh, he'll be fine," and they gave him a fucking little fucking oxygen thing and they sent him home. Then he goes home, he takes another breathing treatment and he's still fucking laboriously breathing. So they took him to Cardinal Glenn and DePaul and uh, they took care of him there. But like, if you're ever in St. Louis, you get hurt, don't ever go to SLU. That's my alma mater's hospital. Don't go to SLU at Cardinal, Gl Cardinal Glennon. Like, it's so fucked up there. Like, they, they're just fucking negligent. I don't know what the problem is. 
uh, older people tell me that it didn't used to be like that, but like everybody has a bad slew hospital experience. Go to Barnes. Diaspora's struggle worldwide. So to see it, let's watch a bit of that very first scene in the movie and see if you can catch a really telling detail. If you blink, you missed it. So let's look one more time and freeze right there. See that? If you brighten things up a little bit, you can tell that the asteroid of vibranium is landing in Central Africa. In fact, if you were to map out exactly where it lands, it looks like it's landing in what today would be the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And if you know anything about the Congo and watch my video about Black Panther, you see how this all still fits within the movie and the comic. The ongoing genocide in Palestine has dominated most leftist and progressive spaces and for good reason. But the discourse about the ongoing crisis in the Congo, which has claimed many lives and left millions displaced, has sadly been underreported on. And I'm included in that criticism as I didn't even know really what was happening in the Congo until people started bringing it up after October 7th, 2023. I knew that the Congo had been in a perpetual state of conflict, but I didn't know how heightened it had gotten over the last year. But I immediately recognized that the mythology of Wakanda mirrors or maybe even inverts the actual reality of what's happening in the Congo. I want to be clear, I'm not an expert in what's happening in the Congo, and I want to be very, very clear that this video is not even close to providing you a decent overview or background on how things got this bad. So I'll leave some links in the description for further research. But to quickly cut through things, what's happening in the Congo is a result of a long history of exploitation from colonialism with numerous villains and layers upon layers of prior history to dig through. Like I'd have to go all- Why do you still call the Democratic Republic of the Congo Zaire? And um, like, they, uh, if I recall correctly, Congolese people don't even call it the Congo, they just call it Congo. All the way back to the Berlin Conference in the late 1800s and the scramble of Africa, which preceded and came after that conference. In this meeting, Europeans came together after they realized- A good book on the Congo, actually, like the history of why all this shit came to be, like why the Congo was so fucked is uh, Adam Hochschild's, Hochschild, I don't know how to pronounce fucking crowd names, but it's called King Leopold's Ghost. And uh, another one, if I recall correctly, is Heart of Darkness. So those two books, um, you should read those. And it explains why the Congo was so fun. That there were valuable natural resources in Africa. And they were so thirsty to colonize and exploit it that they had to have a sit down to decide who would get what or war would break out among them. Unsurprisingly, no Africans were in charge or even invited to this meeting. In the aftermath, the yeah, King Leopold's ghost, a story of greed, terror, and heroism of colonial Africa, Adam Hochschild. So, description. In the 1880s, as European powers were carving up Africa, King Leopold II of Belgium sees for himself the vast and mostly unexplored territory surrounding the Congo River. Carrying out a genocidal plundering of the Congo, he looted its rubber, brutalized its people, and ultimately slashed its population by 10 million, all the while shrewdly cultivating his reputation as a great humanitarian. Heroic efforts to expose these crimes eventually led to the first great human rights movement of the 20th century, in which everyone from Mark Twain to the Archbishop of Canterbury participated. King Leopold's ghost is the haunting account of a megalomaniac of monstrous proportions, a man as cunning, charming, and cruel as any of the great Shakespearean villains. It is also the deeply moving portrait of those who fought Leopold, a brave handful of missionaries, you travelers and young idealists who went to Africa for work or adventure and unexpectedly found themselves witnesses to a Holocaust. Adam Hochschild brings this largely untold story alive with the wit and skill of a Bar Barbara Tuchman. Like her, he knows that history often provides a far richer cast of characters than any novelist could invent. So yeah, check it out. It's good. Congo was colonized by Belgium and ruled by King Leopold. Under him, the nation existed in a... It wasn't, it wasn't just like rule. It was rule. Like it was literally, it wasn't a Belgian colony. Okay. It was Leopold's colony. Like the Congo Free State, it was literally called a free state because it was everything in there was free to Leopold. He basically owned the Congo as his personal property. That would be like me going out to Nicaragua and being like, you know what? All this shit is mine now. All you guys belong to me. All you guys going to work for me. Come on, come grow coffee for me or I chop your fucking hands off. Let's go, chop, chop. That's what he did. Brutal settler colonial state for nearly 75 years until the Congo gained its independence under the leadership of Patrice Lumumba. Lumumba's famous independence speech is seen as a seminal moment in pan-African political history. And it's You know how they killed him? Like they took him out to the middle of the fucking jungle. 
just kong him everywhere it's jungle they uh killed him and then they dissolved his body in acid and then one of the guys ripped his golden tooth out and it was just returned to the congo a few years ago inspired the civil rights movement and the black panthers as well as this speech of questionable political intent with the cia agent in the back being like yeah yeah i do like this movie though i do but i understand Why yeah so all that's left of this guy after they dissolved him in a bathtub full of acid was a gold crown tooth it's the only part of his body that exists after his remains were dissolved in acid the Belgian policeman who oversaw the disposal took the truth as a took the tooth as a trophy. So it's like when you kill an element elephant, you rip his tusks out or you chop up his hide and make a whip out of it. Like in the Congo and in uh, a lot of the German colonies, like they had literal whips that were made out of rhinoceros hide. Would you want to be beaten with something made out of rhinoceros hide? I don't think so. But uh, they gave his tooth back. It was returned to the family last week. This was in 2022 and it's towards several parts of the DR Congo and a coffin. So imagine your coffin and all that's in there is a fucking gold tooth. <laughs> yeah. So they murdered this guy. That's the tooth, by the way. They murdered this guy and they yeeted out his golden tooth. I'm surprised a sick fuck didn't sell it. The guy that the policeman that did it was named Gerard Soete. And uh, yeah. It's fucking morbid shit. Watch the whole video for more details. Lumumba was almost immediately assassinated and his body mutilated by the Belgian government, likely with help from the American CIA, and the Congo has basically been in turmoil ever since. Now, to list the specific villains of the Congo's extended turmoil would be too difficult, the list would be too long, but it includes pretty much every Western nation, numerous local militias in the Congo, tons of major corporations, and to a great extent, us as consumers of the products of those corporations. Because much like the mythological Wakanda, the Congo has incredible, valuable mineral resources, specifically gold, copper, and most significantly right now, cobalt. Cobalt is becoming increasingly valuable as it's a key ingredient to modern technological advancements and batteries and cellular devices. That Tesla you saved up for, the cell phone or tablet you're probably watching this on, all of that contains cobalt and likely cobalt mined from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. As the value of this metal increases, the fight to control who has access to it does as well. And it has led to conflict with the DRC state, multiple rebel groups in Rwanda, leading to numerous military campaigns across Eastern Congo, killing thousands, displacing millions, and causing an unforeseen humanitarian crisis with every bad thing you can think of in between. But understand, as is typical in many developing nations, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, do y'all know what I like? Why the Hutu and the Tutsi like hate each other? Like, DR was born in 1994. There was like a genocide. Like, the Hutu basically rose up, and their slogan was "Chop the tall trees," because on average, uh, the Tutsi, who are descended from um, pastoral nomads, uh, cattle raising people, so you drink a lot of milk, you get tall. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I was reading Joseph Bonanno. He was a Big mafia dude. He ended up retiring and moving to Arizona. But he said that like in his native homeland of Sicily, like you could tell who the rich were because uh because they were taller than the poor. So um anyways, um so yeah, you had the Tutsi and um the Hutu who were pastoralists. They were uh they were farmers and they were sedentary people. So the Tutsi basically ended up establishing an aristocracy over the Hutu. And when the Belgians came to occupy Rwanda they basically like they they were big on eugenics so they actually like conjured up some shit that the tutsi were of a whole different race than the hutu obviously this was bullshit like all other race science but they conjured this up and they actually like they favored the tutsi they divide and rule that's how europeans uh do things so divide and rule and through that uh after the belgians left you had the hutu that were um that were basically wanting to like seek revenge against these these people who were used as puppets of Belgian imperialism so it just it was just like squabble after squabble after squabble until the Hutu who are if I recall correctly more numerous than the Tutsi decided to just rise up and murder them all so a lot of the Tutsi ended up fleeing into the Congo um and they ended up forming these militias like M23 which is one of the major players in the war that's going on in the eastern Congo right now so yeah
All these entities that are at war are being perpetuated. No, the Germans did not control Rwanda. The Belgians did. Of course, basically they're the same people. Rwanda, Urundi. It was part of German East Africa, but it was occupied by troops from the Belgian Congo during World War I. It was administered by Belgium under military occupation. So it's basically the current day states of Rwanda and Burundi, Rwanda, Urundi. And then in 1962, it became independent states of Rwanda and Burundi. But yeah, the Europeans showed up and they just chopped up Africa and they made lines and demarcation where none had previously existed. And that's where, honestly, a lot of these fucking wars started by Western and even now Chinese and Russian entities as they scramble for the power to exploit Africa just like Europe did in the late 1800s. That never actually stopped. It just got more sophisticated. And this reality is exactly why the mythological Wakanda said it was trying to prevent by hiding its wealth and resources. I've seen it said that the Congo would have long since been the richest nation in the world if it were allowed sovereignty over its own natural resources and that it could probably power all of Africa with its resources if it had to. That's how much this one. Yeah, you know, like the Congo ring, the Congo River literally could power all the continent if it was dammed. Of course, it also created a huge ass fucking lake, but tourism nation has in its land and they're scrambling and fighting for it because there's still even today so much left to get. And it's no wonder why other corporations and nations have been hell bent on keeping access to this country for over a century. In Wakanda, a lot of the villains are either fellow Africans seeking to take Wakanda's power, often with the aid and support of outside white forces, or the white forces themselves in the form of invaders and smugglers. And while Ulysses claw with his vibranium hand that shoots lasers is a bit on the nose, it's not all that far from Elon Musk, whose family was in some sort of shady colonizer, emerald mine type business in Africa. And his current baby corporation, Tesla, is one of the biggest factors in the forces behind this ongoing crisis. Now, comparing this real life catastrophe to a Marvel movie and comic book is silly and inconsequential, but I'm doing that because I want to bring attention to this issue to a wider audience and often connections to media help simplify complex issues and make them easier to understand and digest and hopefully serve as a starting point for people to learn more and possibly find a way to help. This started just as an idea to talk about how I noticed that revelation that Wakanda was in the Congo, but even then I didn't know enough about what's going on there and the little bit I've learned about it. This will end up being a main channel video at the end of the day you'll see it when you see it. Last thing I wanna say is that when we think about global anti-blackness and yes, for you FBA Eidos types, that includes everyone. Boo, fuck FBA, fuck Eidos. Look, I was arguing with those Egyptian right-wing nationalists the other day. They were like, some people were accusing me of being Eidos or FBA. And I mean like, every bullshit is rooted in, um, it's rooted in some grain of truth, okay? especially pertaining to black people like black people we catch hell every fucking where we go like yeah in america like we are the richest black people in the diaspora but like east asia india uh like all these other different places like we're not treated as well as our white counterparts from america there of course when they find out that we're american their eyes flare up because they know yankee equals money but like yeah so when they say anti-blackness is global, that's what they mean. A lot of it does come from colonialism and imperialism, where they were basically taught that the further away from blackness you are, the better you are. But a lot of this stuff is like, a lot of this stuff existed long before they even knew what a European was. A lot of it is also class-based. Like they treat their own ethnic, uh, their own ethnic people who are darker than them like shit. We the definitions are literally right here. Foundational black American and American descendant of slavery. Basically, reactionary movements that hate immigrants, including black immigrants from the West Indies and Africa. Everyone, we have to recognize that there's a specific and explicit reason why anti-black racism exists almost exactly the same across the world. And that's because it's understood that a unified Africa, a unified African people across the globe will be the end of civilization as we know it. In a good way. It's not just the... I, lo I love this Pan-Africanism. I love the Pan-Africanism.
Congo, but numerous nations in Africa provide incredibly valuable resources to the world's economy. And being able to obtain those resources for cheap without any of the profits going to support the nations they are extracted from is a key part of keeping the status quo. Africa is often in turmoil because of what's left of colonialism or the fact that colonialism actually never left. And that's what makes my reading of this concerning in speech at the end of the movie a bit more lenient. The kingdom of Kush wasn't in ancient Egypt. They actually did conquer ancient Egypt at one point. But uh, look, let's not start off the fucking Egyptian discourse again. That was two days ago. I'm going to find something new to argue about. I thought I was going to end up getting into it with all of Brazil today, but they laid off. They called me gringo. Like, apparently gringo in Brazil does not just mean white people. It means any American or any foreigner. It's fucking weird. Like, the Mexicans I know, like, they use it to refer to white people. But the Brazilians, they use it to refer to any foreigner. It's funny. It's why it's hard for me to only see the bad parts. Because I always look at that last line, we are all one tribe, not to be the neoliberal, disney cringe call for this mythical, richest nation in the world to share its resources with the world, something they didn't do years later in Wakanda forever, by the way. Instead, I always saw it as a nod to the need for unity across the diaspora, getting everyone on one accord for a liberation agenda to recognize that if one ain't free, we all ain't free. To quote the homie Think Peace Tribe, a unified Africa would make Western nations and every corporation who profits off of exploiting that continent crumble at the seams. That boy only like 20 years old. That shit is amazing. The fighting in the Congo has gotten bad enough that their government has reinstated the death penalty after over 20 years of a moratorium Eesh. with the hopes that this will somehow mitigate the ongoing violence from these various militias and factions in conflict around the nation. Amazingly, coverage of this particular development is lacking on more left-wing news sources. Depending on your political positions, certain stories may never get your attention. That's why I appreciate the sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is a website and app developed by all right, Unc, I know you got to get your fucking coins, but I'm not in the mood to watch an ad. Love you, though. Let's see what's going on in Twitter world. DSA had an, uh, a NPC meeting today. I didn't follow it because I'm not an NPC. I'm not an NPC. I'm the main fucking character, bitch. Anyways. Uh, Dance of the Dragons. Am I team black or team green? I'm of the party of the princess. I'm black. Anything black, I'm joining. Well, I guess except the black shirts, but regardless. But this is my summation, comrade. Skylo says that now everyone should kiss. I agree. Your lord commands it. Nicholas II, sobbing, preparing to be executed. Bolshevik says, hey. Nicholas, what? Bolshevik, I'm sorry, comrade. Nicholas, regaining composure. Open fire, please. Communism. Excuse me if I'm dumb. You're not dumb. Well, anyways. But why are people trying to sit at the DSA NPC is undemocratic? Did we not send chapter delegates to elect the current NPC to lead a convention? I don't know how many like faction fights you've been through, but like if one faction or one group of people, one group of caucuses or whatever, the left block takes over something, uh, the writers are going to piss and moan and whine because they're not getting their way. So that's what's happening. The writers didn't get their way, so they're whining. Like this, if the socialist movement of our lifetime collapses, there are 11 names who will be able to directly pin it on. No, if a, if if staff getting if staff getting laid off leads to the collapse of your socialist organization, your socialist organization really wasn't all that uh all that solid at the fundamentals of, to be honest. In solidarity with the Palestinian struggle, actionists put their liberty on the line to bring down Israel's weapons trade. And it worked. Their direct action forced Elbit out of Tamworth. Now it's time to shut down the rest. The rest. I've been following Palestine action for a while, and I really dig them. Like they are the vanguard. They are the vanguard of the pro-Palestine movement of the Palestine Solidarity Movement in the Imperial Corps in both Britain and the United States. Like they're actually doing material damage to the Zionist entity. Like, how the fuck does protesting and marching around in the street like a bunch of lemmings behind the cops until the cops decide they want to turn around and beat the fuck out of you? How does that provide material support? Like, there were like there were marches that encompassed, encompassed millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people leading up to the war in Iraq. What happened to the, what happened in Iraq anyways? The U.S. invaded anyways. 
feet in the street or no feet in the street. Marches really don't accomplish anything unless you recognize like that they're to be used as displays of strength. Marching around and getting your people arrested on purpose, that's not a display of strength, that's a display of weakness. This actually caused material damage to the functionaries of genocide. That's based. That's what needs to be doing. That's what everybody should be copying. Good news for my state. Workers at a Toyota engine plant in Troy, Missouri. I've been to Troy, Missouri. It's a horrible place. One public with their campaign to join the UAW, United Auto Workers. It's the first announced campaign in UAW's current union drive at Toyota, the world's largest automaker. Why are they joining the UAW? They want to take back their time to spend it with family and rest and recover from injury. So our bodies can last as long as Toyota's engines, another worker says. Workers describe a grinding pace. They work 10 and 12 hour schedules in sweltering temperatures that top 100 degrees Fahrenheit in summer. The result is that their bodies break down. For example, torn rotator cuffs, a common injury at the plant in Troy. The work environment is also hazardous in other ways. One worker suffered a fractured skull, which has left her with excruciating migraine headaches. The plant is not safe, says Jay Hochuli, a team leader at the plant, in a press statement. They had me crawl under a desk, under a deck, to clean out the sand and silica dust, which could literally make you blind if you are exposed to it for long enough, and chemicals that come out of these machines. It was a confined space. I should have been in a respirator and a hazmat suit. All they gave me was a KN95 mask. I came home and that dust was in my hair, on my clothes, in my underwear, in your eyes. Like I just said, that shit could literally make you blind. So, all power to them. All power to them. I hope they win. The red and the black. I thought this was going to be about black people. But it's just more economic nerd shit. Israel made secret deals in the 60s and 80s to help give arms and security to Ethiopia in exchange for their Jews. Ethiopia will receive arms to crush liberation efforts and Israel will have a steady flow of settlers. So basically what America did with the Scots-Irish. And this is the result, this fucking clown. So this is a black man in the IDF, an Israeli soldier, dancing on top of the rubble of somebody's house. There are so many contradictions in that video, my head is about to fall off. I made a lot of money trading stock on the company owned by Donald Trump. I don't care about politics, I care about my family's wealth, so you're a fascist. The stock is clearly overpriced, and anyone who understands investing knows how to make money from mass irrational behavior. I don't know, I would consider irrational behavior saying that you don't care about politics and you only care about money. This dude is an excellent glimpse into the mind of the wannabe black bourgeoisie, the wannabe black ruling class. These are the types of motherfuckers that would sell their own people into slavery. All should read Bao Yu Ching's China, Socialist Development and Capitalist Restoration. I have a copy in a stack of books behind me. And study how China managed to develop its economy until 1977 without transforming its country into a sweatshop of foreign capital. Any questions you have about Mao's position on China can be answered here by reading books instead of bugging me. So, more on PAL action. Permanently shut down Elbit in Tam. Kendrell Parker is among the most frail inmates in Louisiana's prison system. As a quadriplegic, so he cannot move any of his limbs, he is confined to the medical ward at Angola Prison, where the health care was ruled by a federal judge to be aberrant, cruel, and unusual punishment. Everyone will die in prison. How Louisiana's plan to lock people up longer imperils its sickest inmates. This article was produced for ProPublica's local reporting network in partnership with Verite News. Sign up for dispatches to get stories like this one as soon as they are published. Janice Parker walked into the medical ward at the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola several years back, looking for her son, Kentrell Parker. He should have been easy to find. The 45-year-old New Orleans native had been bedridden since an injury in a prison football game left him paralyzed from the neck down more than a decade earlier. Damn. That's exactly why I didn't play football in high school. 
His, I don't want some motherfucker wiping my ass for me for the rest of my life. His bed was usually positioned near a window by the nurse's station. When she didn't see him there, Janice Parker feared the worst. Her son is completely dependent on staff to keep him alive. To feed him, clean him after bowel movements, change his catheter, and prevent him from choking. Because he struggles to clear his throat, even a little mucus can be life-threatening. A nurse pointed toward a door that was ajar. Janice Parker's son was alive, but she was disturbed by what she saw. He was alone in a dark, grimy room slightly larger than a bathroom, with no medical staff or orderlies nearby. He was there, he told his mother in a raspy voice, because a nurse had written him up for complaining about his care. So if a guy depends on nurses and staff to literally wipe his ass for him after he shits, I mean, like, if somebody doesn't treat him well, doesn't he have the right to complain? So you just, so instead of, like, actually heeding this fellow's complaints, you just throw him in a bathroom-sized room that's dirty and filthy, like... When you're when you have catheters and feeding tubes and trachea trach tubes and shit like that, like you gotta keep that shit clean. Like, just the slightest fucking contamination there can literally fucking kill you. You can go into sepsis and all sorts of other shit and die an extremely painful death. But these people don't care. They just chuck them in this filthy room. Oh my god, we need revolution. This was his punishment: the medical ward's version of solitary confinement. He told her he had been in the room for days. Janice Parker said during a recent interview. There was no one at his bedside. And he can't holler for help if needed, she said. For years, Janice Parker said she has complained to nurses and prison officials in person, over the phone, and through an attorney about the neglect that she has witnessed on her frequent visits and that her son has described. He has told her that he's gone days without food. He has developed urinary tract infections Ugh. because his catheter hasn't been changed. At one point, Oh my god, that made my dick hurt. Yeah. The only the only solution for shit like that is a fucking revolution, honestly. Happening right now, three buses just loaded up with illegal invaders at Detroit Metro. It was the fucking Gonzaga University men's football team. It's the fucking it's a fucking college basketball team. And I mean I mean these people are comical. But they're also dangerous. They're so dangerous because Based on these narratives, these people are literally go out and start shooting people. Oh, my state's attorney general plans to sue to stop a Biden administration plan to forgive student loans. Honestly, I think this dude, like, I don't think this dude can go to sleep without having done something indescribably fucked up and evil that day. <laughs> I, I, I don't. Like, I think this guy gets up in the morning thinking about who he could fuck over. Like, why would you do that? And he's joining hands with the attorney general in Kansas who is joining hands with 11 other states. Like, why would you want to stop a plan to forgive student loans? Like, do you have any idea how popular forgiving student loans is amongst Zoomers and millennials? Like, we will literally love you. We will literally suck your dick. And you want, why? Is it some type of fucked up, warped, um, Calvinist bullshit? Like, People need to suffer so that they can be better people or something. Like, I, I, I don't fucking... Well, actually, I do. It's not that... Like, these people are, of course, evil, but, like, th they work for the capitalist. That's the only way we can explain it. Like, these people are raw, unmitigated fascists. Fascism is the rule of the most reactionary strata of the bourgeoisie, and we live in a fascist country. George Jackson said it long ago. He said that why are we still arguing over what fascism is? Like, we live, we live under it now. We live under it now. Old Bolshevik. He doesn't even remember me. I don't even count. Everybody else is just getting... Oh, I'm sorry. I got to put on my horrible Russian accent. Old Bolshevik. He doesn't even remember me. I don't even count. Everybody else is just get arrested midnight and shot, and here I am just fine. Wife, don't worry. I'm sure Comrade Stalin won't forget you. Why, well, I bet that's NKVD right now. Oh, thank you, Comrade Stolen. I am somebody. I have, I have clout, after all. Slaves is a total percentage of the population in 1860, so this is the Mississippi Delta region. This little chunk right here is actually where my family's from. So, yeah. They had us work that fucking rich black dirt. 
And ironically, like, this is where the Black Belt thesis comes from, the Black Belt National thesis. Like, this um, this is why the CPUSA, now the Communist International, was like, yeah, this is where black people are concentrated. A lot of us are moving down south. Like, you got the Sea Islands where the, uh, the Gullah people live over here basically the most Africanized people in the, uh, in the country. Um, like they have their own fucking language. It's really cool. Um, but yeah, so this is why, like, this is where we were forced into, uh, into being as a people. This, this is my state right here. Um, this is, this area is called little Dixie. They grew, they had a lot of immigrants that moved from Virginia all the way over here. You have Illinois, uh, Indiana, Ohio, no, these were slave states. So, yeah. And you also have like East Texas, a lot of slaves over there. But this is the center of New Africanness. Wasn't it Inere who said something like the United States is a one party state, but in typical American arrogance, it has two parties? Yes. I see you see memes. Is this a hunk of Kansas over here? Yeah. Hustle culture is right-wing propaganda aimed at the glorification of servitude. If you want an example of how, like, evil ages you, this is Bill Clinton in 1993. This is Bill Clinton now. He literally looks like a fucking ghost. Don't be evil. Someone asked Kassan if he'll fund my lawsuit against Drew Pavlo. It's pretty much a slam dunk win if I get the money for it. So we have a Greek asking a Turk to fund his lawsuit against another Greek. <laughs> Go ahead, say competition is bourgeois individualism Tell me that telling people to buy an arrow is elitist Tell me you need an obscure 80s gun to get people interested in shooting Owning a Glock is gatekeeping Buying a SIG is imperialism Buying an AR is classes It doesn't have to make any sense Go ahead, I'm waiting <laughs> Wet yoga class You will be completely soaked in herbal liquid Attendees must learn to fold and unfold their genitals Do not attend if you can't hold your breath for 33 lunar seconds Buckets and rags are available for $6. Free tree bark snack provided. Please do not eat onions 48 hours before class. There will be loud screaming. Please bring signed waiver allowing agreeing to allow the great horned owl to observe you silently for the duration of the wet yoga practice. Anybody want to go to wet yoga? I mean, I want a tree bark snack. I have no mercy or compassion in me for a society that will crush people and then penalize them for not being able to stand up out of the way. LeBron James reportedly established an independent socialist government in Paris, but refused to march on Versailles or seize the banks. Shame. Havana syndrome. In Florida may have provided the vital clue. Pull over! Pull over! To a national security mystery. <laughs> Many U.S. officials and their families believe they've been injured by a secret weapon in the hands of a foreign adversary. Oh, no! It's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. For the first time, we have evidence of who might be responsible. Are we being attacked? My personal opinion, yes. By whom? No oh, fucking cliffhangers. For the first time, sources tell 60 Minutes they have evidence that a U.S. adversary may be involved in attacks on American government officials and a condition known as Havana Syndrome. Uh, my buddies are Martians. Maybe you shouldn't go work for the United States government. <laughs> Tens of thousands of Jordanians in Amman are protesting outside the Israeli embassy. Unprecedented numbers. We swear by the Almighty God to support the resistance, to reject normalization, and to sacrifice our lives... <laughs> and blood for Gaza. Inshallah, we see the collapse of the corrupt Jordanian monarchy this year. You don't want to be a big account. And I'm not even that big of an, I'm not even that big of an account. I only have 25... 25,000 followers, okay? Like, I lost a bunch after that fucking Egyptian squabble. But you don't want to be a big account. Like, enjoy your 200 followers and be happy you're spared being dragged into stupid drama every week. 
or you don't have people in your fucking inbox asking you stupid questions that can be answered by a cursory reading of the communist manifesto. <laughs> Not enough of you have woken up to the reality that our martyrs are in the hundreds of thousands. We are weeks away from seeing hundreds of thousands more in Rafa, and some of you are still talking about democratic primaries. She's right. Like, she's right. Also, in the heat of a political discussion, please don't tell people to uh, to self-redact. Please don't tell people to, to harm themselves. Like, that. that's... Don't, why would you do that? That's evil. Okay? That's fucking evil. Like, this person is on the... Um, Kristen is on the, uh, the National Political Committee of DSA. And people have been, like, spamming her fucking... Um, her fucking... Tweets... Harassing her. Like she says, I wish I could DSA only this, but I want to be vulnerable for a second. These last two months have been the hardest time I've ever had in DSA. I am exhausted. I'm running on emotional fumes. All of us are doing our best and making decisions the best we can. And let's see, is she receiving messages of solidarity? Well, let's see, we've got a Frizzo guy here. Man, that's tough, but hey, you still have your job to pay your therapist with, unlike all the union organizers you just betrayed. Like, okay, like, if you don't know anything about DSA's internal affairs, like, why are you commenting on them? Shut the fuck up. I love you, Swamp, but the sectarianism is very unbecoming. So I'm sure you'll pull through. Some of them probably won't. <laughs> like, yeah, of course, all of these sectarian groups are going to come and try to make hay with this because that's what the American left does. They see problems in other orgs. Ooh, Jolene is trending. They see problems in other orgs and they're like, oh, we could we could take these people from here and they could join our cult instead. <laughs> and like the previous, like the previous rightist NPC was responsible for this overspending in the first place. Deeply upsetting to see cruel quote tweets on this. And I think some of you should consider intensive therapy and deleting your Twitter accounts. I agree. Yeah, like a lot of these right rightists are assholes. And then when you treat them like this, then they get mad at you. Honestly, we should be treating any of our comrades like this. It's horrible. Bernie 2020, RFK Jr. 2024. Who the fuck hurt you, bro? Slurs, slashing tires, sectionalism, violent threats. Finally, a party that appeals to the Appalachian working class. You hear that, Matt? I pronounced it Appalachia like I'm supposed to. If you're interested in St. Louis uh, architecture and photography, you should follow Chicken Joe. He takes pictures. He also has very uh, scary looking backyard chickens. I'm not a fan of chickens unless they're dead and deep fried. You ever heard of Popeyes? Yes, that is a rush hour reference. God, I'm old. But like he takes really good pictures of uh, St. Louis and our architecture. Like we have a lot of cool shit here. Like this beautiful fucking Victorian in College Hill. That's a... Uh, one of the oldest freestanding water towers in the city. But like it depresses me. Like these should be these these residences, these beautiful four families should be occupied by working class people. Like the bricks are still fucking there. They're solid. They just need some fucking work. Like under socialism, we would be funding. We would be funding the re rehab rehabilitation of these uh of these fucking houses. Like there's no way. Look, this beautiful fucking art deco just sitting there, rotting. These are houses in College Hill. Like this shit is beautiful. But white people used to live in these houses and the white people that lived in them left and took the tax base with them. But yeah, we've got a lot of art deco. A lot, Actually, every architectural style since 1850, you could find represented in St. Louis. Here's an old frame house. It was built in the 1850s and they tore it down. Like we're destroying our architectural heritage. The ruins of a small black, small black business. St. Louis in the Madeline Anderson documentary, The Walls Came Tumbling Down, 1975, about a rent strike by public housing tenants. Yeah, we had a major rent strike here uh, in 1969, I believe, at pruitt Igo. Yeah. Come to my town. Look at the beautiful buildings. Just don't move here drive up the price of every fucking thing. I want to be able to buy a house one fucking day. Yemen makes his position even clearer with a new anthem dedicated to Gaza and the Palestinian people. Like, 
I need one of those fucking knives they have. بال فهر ونحن واقفون بالنصر والعجبة للمتجين. دماؤكم دماؤنا. This video goes hard, but why is the editing always weird on Arab videos? It feels like I'm watching North Korean TV. I mean, this is a small, poor, extremely poor, war-torn country. I don't think they're buying fucking $15,000 cameras, bro. You spoiled Yankee. <laughs> Bro, I could do better than this with a 1998 camera. I did film before. Well, go, go to Yemen and offer your services. I'm sure they just they just love to have a Midwestern white kid that thinks he knows everything help with their cause. All right, go over there. Matter of fact, when we make the revolution here, you're in charge of all the cinematography and filming and editing and all that. I can't wait to cast Giancarlo Esposito and everything. You'd even have him play me? <laughs> no, I think you'd have to get Lawrence Fishburne for that. Henry Cavill is Hassan. I'm pretty sure that's anti-Turkic or Turkophobic or whatever you call somebody that doesn't like Turks. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you should have Henry Cavill play Sink. What a beautiful hymn. 
So um, the congressman for the city of St. Louis, congresswoman rather, Cory Bush, wrote a letter to the, no, I don't condemn Hamas, I condone Hamas. May one, two, many Hamases form. So they're closing a pharmacy on, um, on Grand, and this is a pharmacy desert. Like a lot of people in the city don't have access to, uh, to vehicles to drive them to pick up their medications, and they're closing a pharmacy in a, like, deeply poverty-stricken area. So Cory Bush is doing a fucking job. Hopefully she isn't unasked by West Bell. If you don't vote for me, you ain't black. This is fucking Frederick Robinette Douglas. If you don't, if you cast, don't give you a play. We go to Slice City. They they use Louis Farrakhan and then they called me a gringo. Farrakhan is a Brazilian, even though he looks Brazilian. Honestly, there's no such thing as looking like fucking a fucking Brazilian. Like a Brazilian could look like anything. Let me ban this troll. Um, yeah, if you're in DSA, quit being pricks to the NPC. They're doing their best. They're doing their best. Maybe if these, um, if the rightists had left them such a mess, then this shit wouldn't need to be happening. But it's happening, and I think they're doing what's good for the org, and I have full faith and confidence in them. Where am I going to be in 20 years? 10% of you say I'm going to be a politician. 41% of you say that I'm going to be a revolutionary still. 32.7% of you say I'm going to be Millennial Van Jones. And 16.4 of you think that I'm going to be a comedian. I mean, St. Louis has produced some pretty dope comedians. Dick Gregory, Cedric the Entertainer. I think Red Fox was here, was from here, or he lived here at one time. Yeah, I'm a DEI. I am a delightful, erudite individual. I'm very smart. Yeah, Allah, you are so stupid. Remember that? I do. I'm Pepperidge Farms. I remember everything. Do you have any idea, like, how racist you have to be to make the, like, a NAACP honcho say something like this? You gotta be pretty fucking racist. Like, the NAACP are the most inoffensive people ever. Want to learn how to unionize at Sonic Speed? There. I'll show you how to unionize your workplace at Sonic Speed. Talk to your coworkers. Discuss your shared concerns and find common goals. Research and choose a union that fits your needs. Share the info with your coworkers. Sign those union cards. When you've got enough support, file a petition with the National Labor Relations Board. Win the election and negotiate a contract. Together, you'll make your workplace better and fairer for everyone. Gotta unionize fast. Hopefully that helps. And yes, it is quite a bit more complicated than that, but yeah. And let's close on the fact that I'm the only cool Maoist. There are no Maoists cooler than me. All other Maoists are fucking lame. They're jive turkeys. They suck. So if you want cool Maoism, follow me. NAACP is also, yes, anti-communist. But Du Bois, one of the founding members, actually advanced a lot, and he made up for his anti-communism. People call him the Lenin of America. Of course, I have his hairline, so maybe... Maybe I'm the next Lenin of America. Who knows? Peace.